So we are going to try to understand created kinds with bunnies. Uh, this is just going to be a general example of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about created kinds in the world of young age creationism. So there are lots of bunnies in the world. There are little fuzzy bunnies that we find here in the temperate regions of North America. There are up in the northern regions, Arctic hares, which are white in the snow to provide camouflage there. Out in the drier climates, uh, the prairie, the desert, we have things like jackrabbits, which have really big ears and very, very distinct tan sort of coloration to help them blend in with their surroundings. So there's lots of bunnies. According to biology, bunnies are members of the family Liporidae. Uh, and there are 54 different species of rabbits and hares, uh, and they're found all around the world. Now, there are other critters that are very similar to bunnies. Those critters are called pikas. So this is a pika. They're members of family Okatonidae. There are 30 species of them, and they're also found around the world. And they differ from bunnies, especially in the fact that they don't have the big ears of bunnies, and they don't have the big hind legs of bunnies. Okay, so where do these creatures come from? Well, an evolutionist would say there's an evolutionary tree that unites them all together, and that bunnies and pikas evolved from some common ancestor that lived millions of years ago and took a very long time. So here's an evolutionary tree showing you this, and the blue guys here are the bunnies, the yellow guys are the pikas, and then in the white we have a couple of fossil forms that uh, are no longer alive. And one of those is this guy right here, Paleolagus. And you can see, well, if you've ever seen a bunny with all of his skin pulled off, or the skull of a bunny, um, that looks a lot like what a bunny looks like uh, underneath of his skin and muscle. So Paleolagus is really similar to modern bunnies, so it really is kind of, I think, obvious how Paleolagus must be connected in some way to these other sort of critters. At least, that's what it appears to be. So how would a creationist understand the origin of bunnies and how these things all relate together? Good question. Well, I can take the data that was used to make this evolutionary tree, and I can flip it around and analyze it in a different way. And so in this diagram, the little dots represent the bunnies or the pikas or the little fossil forms. And how close they are together represents how similar they appear to be how many characters they have in common. Uh, down here on the bottom right, we have the bunnies, family Leporidae, forming a nice tight little cluster there, the very similar things, which makes sense because bunnies are bunnies, right? And over here in the yellow, we have the pikas, family Octonidae, uh, and they are very similar to one another as well, but they are noticeably different from the bunnies. We've already mentioned the ears and the hind legs, and you can see in the diagram there's a really big gap. They're very different, and I know from my statistical studies that I've done that that difference is significant. So based on that, I would conclude that the bunnies are created kind, that all of our modern bunnies are members of a single created family. Okay, so how does that actually work? Well, remember back in the beginning, when God was creating everything, he made bunnies, right? And so there were bunnies. Now, how many bunnies were there? How many bunnies did God create? I don't know. I think we tend to think that he made two bunnies because he made, you know, Adam and Eve, but we don't know that that's the case. He might have made, a, you know, a couple dozen bunnies and different forms of bunnies. So I've just shown a couple of different varieties of bunnies here, a couple of different shapes. One thing we do know about the original bunny is that they weren't globally distributed because God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so, of course, they do that. And they do that and they do that because, of course, they breed like rabbits. And so pretty soon there's bunnies everywhere. And as time goes by, there's a flood, right? And so two bunnies are selected out of all of the bunnies that are alive at the time to go onto the ark. Now, it's not two of every variety of bunny, two of every sort of bunny. It's two from the created kind of bunnies, all the things that have descended from the original population of bunnies. And so two of those go on the ark, the rest of them are destroyed in the flood. And then, of course, God says again to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and so there are now bunnies 
reproducing again. And guess what? As they do that, there's some varieties of bunnies that are generated at that point. So that's where you get the Arctic Hare and the Desert Jackrabbit and all those other sorts of bunnies that we have today. All 54 things that we call species today would have come from two bunnies that lived and survived the flood aboard Noah's Ark. Now you might be thinking, hey, that sounds a lot like evolution, right? I mean, they're all evolving from a common ancestor. So isn't that just evolution? Well, no, I don't think so. I think there are three things that make this very different from what an evolutionist would say about this. In the first place, what's happening with these bunnies is happening very quickly, much, much faster than evolution. We can monitor evolutionary changes today, and we can see it takes it's going to take centuries in some cases to generate very minor changes in populations. This is happening over the course of a few generations, which is much, much quicker. We can see that it's very specific. Modern Darwinian evolution is sort of random. It's sort of a random, try this and see what happens, and try that and see what happens. And that's not what appears to be happening here. The bunnies that we have today appear to be really well suited for the environments we find them in. The Arctic hare fits in really well in the Arctic. The desert jackrabbit fits in very well in the desert. There doesn't seem to be a lot of trial and error stuff, which again relates to how fast it's going. And we see that it doesn't go on forever. In the evolutionary perspective, evolution would happen and then bunnies would just keep evolving into something that's really different and not obviously a bunny anymore. But in this case, we see that bunnies, they start out as bunnies and they end up as bunnies. So they're still bunnies. All of these things together suggest to me that this is designed to happen, which is very different from evolution. In evolution, it's just sort of happening because there are random changes and they either fit or don't fit an environment. In this case, God is creating these bunnies with the intention that they are going to be able to change and become different forms after the flood. So is this the final word on bunnies? Well, no, of course not. I mean, this is science. There's never a final word in science. There's always going to be more research that could be done, and people can change their minds if there's reason to do so. And I think in this case, there might be reason to do so. So here's Paleolagus again, and I keep looking at this going, that looks like a bunny. It looks a lot like a bunny. And I can totally understand in the future if creation is decide, Paleolagus and, and the pikas, once you take the skin off, they really do look a lot like bunnies. And so maybe we should include them in the bunny-created kind, so that the bunny-created kind is a little bit bigger than what I think it is, based on the evidence that I have. But that's for the future. Right now, given the evidence that I have, I conclude that, hey, the bunnies are a separate created kind. And that is understanding created kinds with bunnies.